Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us, episode 36, How to Land on the Moon. Last time, we talked about the flight of Apollo 10. NASA's second piloted flight to the moon almost taunted us by flying to a mere 50,000 feet above the lunar surface before turning around to head home. This Pathfinder mission followed in the footsteps of Apollo 8 and performed nearly all major phases of a lunar landing mission, omitting the power descent and landing itself. By flying the LEM in its native habitat for the first time, NASA was able to answer some key questions about the nature of the moon's gravitational field, its own flight procedures, and the behavior of the LEM in the lunar environment. And despite some alarming unauthorized dancing on the part of the lunar module Snoopy right before staging, the flight went smoothly. The path was now clear for the crew of Apollo 11 to bridge that final gap and get their boots dirty. But is the space above us ready? Mm, not quite yet. We've got ourselves a Saturn V rocket, a Cadillac of a command and service module, and a sporty little lunar module. We've learned how to fly it all to the moon, how to insert it all into lunar orbit, and we've even taken the LEM out for a spin, or at least several unexpected rolls. All that's left to do is kick up some gray dust and plunk that thing down on the surface, right? Easier said than done. Before we see how Apollo 11 did it, we're going to spend today's episode examining in detail what is required to transition from lunar orbit to the lunar surface while remaining in one piece. As usual, I've drawn from a number of sources when writing this episode, but I will be leaning a little more heavily than usual on a single source, so I wanted to give it a mention. Frank O'Brien's book, The Apollo Guidance Computer, Architecture and Operation, is a book that I first came across while doing research for episode 27, Apollo Computers and Software. To be honest, the coverage of the computer itself wasn't as useful as I was hoping, but the book contains an excellent detailed timeline of the build-up to landing. I'll be cross-referencing that with a bunch of other stuff, in fact I should probably do a supplemental about my sources one of these days, but I wanted to make sure Mr. O'Brien got a nice shout-out. I should also mention that the exact procedures and cabin layout varied a bit from mission to mission, so some of the minor details may end up as an amalgamation of all six landings. To give you an idea of the scale of change that I'm talking about, somewhere between LEM-2, the unflown test article, and Apollo-12, the AGS mode control changed from a dial to a switch. So for the episode on Apollo-10, I wasn't really sure which one it was. Nothing dramatic, but I just want to give you all a heads up. Let's get into it. Close your eyes. Imagine you're on board the Apollo Command Module, orbiting about 100 kilometers above the moon. All right, Commander. The day you've been training for is finally here. Are you ready to head to the surface? Before you do anything else, open up the hatch to the LEM, float on in there, inspect the vehicle, and begin the somewhat lengthy startup process. Better yet, get your lunar module pilot to do it, since, you know, it's his job anyway. This should just involve a lot of coddling the computer, checking that systems are working as expected, and checking that all the switches are in the right place. I'm not sure if this usually happens now or a little later, but an important step in the landing preparations is for the crew to hook into a system of restraints. As you'll recall, the designers of the LEM have taken advantage of the particulars of the lunar landing and done away with chairs for you and your lunar module pilot. Instead, a series of cables, reels, and ratchets are available at each crew station. You guys will hook into the system at the waist. The system allows a certain amount of free movement while also pulling you down with approximately 30 pounds of force. This means that you can stay in the standing position at your console without drifting away during the landing maneuvers. So go ahead and clip in now. Next, it's time to undock. First, put on your helmet and gloves, you know, just in case. Once that's done, place the LEM in a free drift so that it won't fire its attitude control thrusters while close to the CSM. The last thing we need to do is bonk into the command module and put a dent, or a hole, in our new ride. Don't forget to instruct the LEM computer to keep track of the velocity changes that occur during the undocking procedure. They won't be much, but every little bit can affect your orbit. Undock, wait until you've put some distance between the two vehicles, and then re-enable attitude control, leaving the LEM in attitude hold mode. 
Before you get too far apart, face the CSM so that your command module pilot can get a good look at your spacecraft and check that the rendezvous light is working. Yet another important backup. If you like, you can take off your helmet and gloves now, I know they're not the most comfortable. Once everything looks good, the CMP will fire his thrusters and back away, giving you a little room. If this is one of the later missions, the CSM would have already used its big engine to drop you down into a lower orbit. But if this is one of the first two missions, well, first of all, hi Neil or Pete, but secondly, you're going to have to drop your own orbit, so let's cover that just in case. The maneuver to drop your orbit is called the Descent Orbit Insertion. It's going to take you from a roughly 100 km circular orbit to one with a low point of around 15 km. Or since you're a test pilot from the 60s and don't really think in metric, that's about 9 miles or 50,000 feet. You know, this is the same one they did on Apollo 10. It also gives you a good chance to give the descent engine a whirl before getting into the landing proper. If the CSM has already dropped you into a lower orbit, leave the engine arm switch off, but try out the throttle controls. You should see the commanded levels reflected on your dials, but really make sure that the engine arm switch is off first. Sometime around here, Houston is going to send you updated data on the CSM's orbit, which was changed when it backed away from you. Input this into the primary guidance and navigation system, the PINGs, as well as the abort guidance system, the AGs. This way, if something goes wrong, you'll easily be able to find the CSM. As you pass over your landing site from about 50,000 feet, take a good look. I know you've studied the crater maps hundreds of times, but nothing beats the real thing. It's been about an hour since undocking now, so the CSM should be decently far away. Fire up your rendezvous radar and make sure you can get a good fix on the CSM. All of this stuff has been tested before, but not with your specific vehicle while actually in space. So it's best to double check. And triple check. Before you pass around to the far side of the moon, point your high gain antenna in the direction you expect the Earth to be when you come around on the other side. That way you'll be in contact as soon as possible. While back there, double check and calibrate your COS, the Crewman Optical Alignment Site, and your LPD, the Landing Point Designator, by comparing against some known stars. They won't line up perfectly, but they should be close enough. Also, fine-tune the inertial measurement unit. To do this, use the Alignment Optical Telescope to sight some stars and feed that data into the computer. What's that? You don't know what the Alignment Optical Telescope is? I don't know how you forgot. It's not like it's the sort of thing that a podcaster from the future might completely neglect to mention in an episode entirely dedicated to the lunar module. Briefly, it's that big optical instrument in the center of the LEM control panel with the yellow handles. You can't miss it. Take a peek in there, find some known navigation stars, and rotate the dial until the spiral overlay is right on the star. Since the spiral rotates outwards at a constant rate, this is actually a clever way to determine where the LEM is pointed pretty precisely. Also, be sure to calibrate your AGS, the abort guidance system. Just leave the LEM at a specific attitude for a few minutes and let the system monitor how much the gyros drift. This drift rate isn't desirable, but as long as we know what it is and it stays predictable, we can incorporate it into the guidance calculations. Okay, it's been about two hours since undocking. You've already gone around the moon once. Just one more orbit to landing. If this is one of the later missions, go ahead and pressurize the descent propulsion system. Neil and Pete, you've already taken care of this earlier. Give the landing radar a whirl to make sure that it turns on and gets to the expected temperature and all that. It won't have a lock on the ground yet, but we can at least make sure it's not going bonkers. Before passing over the landing site again, copy down the latest state vectors from Houston to make sure that your computer has the latest and greatest data. You know state vectors, your position, velocity, state of your orbit, all that good stuff. Your lunar module pilot should also be copying down all of the abort scenarios that have been calculated for the particulars of your orbit. Capcom will read them up to him. Make sure he writes clearly. As you pass over the landing site, Use your landing point designator to track landmarks and time how long they take to pass by. This gives you your velocity, and thus, your altitude. There should be no surprises here, since your computer will tell you how high you are, but it can confirm that everything is working as expected. It's also worth noting that if things aren't going that great, 
this is a perfect place to begin the process of re-rendezvousing with the CSM, but let's hope it doesn't come to that. It's been just over three hours since undocking, and you've still got about an hour and a half before landing. Perform your last fine alignment of the IMU. It will have drifted a little bit, but by seeing how far it drifted, you can confirm that the drift rates are as expected. If the drift isn't what you predicted, you might have a problem. Prime your AGs for an abort so that you won't have to do it on the fly in case something goes wrong. Switch your reaction control system to a more aggressive setting. Yeah, it'll use a little more fuel, but you want nice snappy controls during the landing. Load up Program 63, the Breaking Phase Program. It shouldn't do anything, but you can check that it has the expected time that you'll fire up the engine. In case you forgot, the landing is broken down into three phases. Braking, Approach, and Landing. During the braking phase, you'll be burning your engine more or less horizontally, dropping your velocity from orbit speed to something more reasonable. During the approach phase, you'll pitch forward and get a better look at your landing site. Make tweaks as appropriate, but remember that the clock is ticking. Finally, the landing phase. Hopefully this is just a straightforward, slow vertical descent. Nice and gentle. Braking, approach, and landing. Remember now? We've only got about an hour left until landing, so if you took your helmet and gloves off, put them back on. Switch the environmental control system to only pump oxygen through your suit circuits rather than the cabin in general. Pull the circuit breakers to arm the staging pyros. You'll need to stage in a hurry in the case of an abandoned landing, so it's best to arm them early. Deploy your hand controllers. It's almost time now. Five minutes until we light the engine. Get your final state vector update from Houston and put the primary guidance system, the pings, in control of the spacecraft. Make sure your AGS has all the latest information. Shortly before you start the burn, the computer will ask permission to place you at the proper attitude. Give it the go-ahead. 30 seconds before ignition, the display with the countdown to engine start will begin flashing. It's sure to get your attention. Flip the master engine arm switch to descent. A few seconds before ignition, fire your RCS thrusters to settle the propellants in their tanks. With 5 seconds left, the computer will flash verb 99, which is its way of asking if you're really sure about this. Press proceed. You shouldn't hear or feel much at first, since the engine will only be running at about 10% thrust. It'll stay like this for around 30 seconds, as it determines the precise center of gravity of the LEM and aims its thrust vector through it. Try not to rock the boat. You will now be in program 63, which covers the braking phase. At this point, you'll be flying feet forward facing down at the moon. This allows you to keep an eye on your approach and make sure that you're on track. But you can't stay like that forever, so after about three and a half minutes, it's time to yaw around. Do it gently, but rotate a full 180 degrees around your thrust vector so that now you're flying feet forward, but with your backs to the moon. The view won't be much, but it will make your final approach a lot easier. Now that the back of the spacecraft is facing the lunar surface, your landing radar should be able to get a lock. This is a particularly interesting moment because it'll be the first time your computer gets a reality check. Once the radar gets a lock, it will tell you your actual altitude. There will inevitably be a difference between where you actually are and where the computer thought you were. This can be upwards of several thousand feet and is called your delta H. If the radar data looks reasonable, go ahead and instruct the computer to incorporate it into its guidance process. It will work to reduce delta H down to zero over time, you know, hopefully before the landing. During this phase of the landing, you'll mostly be keeping an eye on your propulsion systems and making sure that everything is as expected. Your LMP will be busy checking all of the parameters of the spacecraft against pre-made cue cards to make sure you're well within limits. He'll also be watching to make sure that the pings and ags are in close agreement with each other. They don't need to be perfect, but they shouldn't be far apart. In order to give the ags a little help, as you approach 12,000 feet in altitude, your LMP will input a command into the ags keypad, but hold off on hitting enter. The moment you pass through 12,000 feet, he'll hit enter, letting the ags know where you are. It's a little low tech, but for the purposes of a quick escape, it's enough. You'll be getting really close now, so it's time to get a good view of your landing site. Right around 7,000 feet, the computer will ask permission to enter Program 64, the approach phase. 
Don't sweat it if it doesn't happen precisely when you expect it. It'll vary by a few seconds depending on the specifics of your approach. Houston should keep you in the loop on when to expect it. Once you enter program 64, the LEM will start to tilt forward until you're only leaning back about 30 degrees instead of the near horizontal position used for braking. Now that you're actually facing your landing site, the computer will indicate where that is by using the landing point designator. You'll be too busy looking out the window and inspecting your approach to read this yourself, so your LMP should read this off for you. This is also a good time to throw the control system into attitude hold mode and give the manual controls a little wiggle to make sure it still feels good. It'll certainly feel different now that most of your fuel is gone. If you don't remember how the landing point designator works, this is what all those lines on your window are all about. Both panes of glass have an identical set, so you can just line yourself up such that it looks like one. That way you'll know you're looking in the right place. By taking the LPD numbers the computer gives you and checking them against the lines on the window, you'll be able to see where the computer is taking you. If you don't like the look of the landing site your computer is heading towards, you can use your rotational controller in your right hand to move it uprange, downrange, or side to side. Your LMP will continue to read out the landing point designator coordinates as your angle changes, as the computer updates it, and as you move it around. If you don't do anything at all, the computer will land for you, right where the LPD is pointing. In fact, Jim Lovell claimed that this was his plan for Apollo 13, but, you know, as we know, he never got the chance. But you're not going to let some stinking computer fly this thing, are you? What if there are boulders? Or a big crater? Or, you know, a really cool chance to execute some of the most badass flying in history? When you're ready to take over manual control, it's time to head into Program 66, Landing Phase. To do this, move your left hand over to the DPS rate switch and flip it up or down. This will place you in manual landing mode, and there's no going back, so don't fat finger it. By flicking the switch up or down, you can control the rate of descent. Each flick adds or removes one foot per second to your descent velocity. This is convenient since your LMP will be reading out your vertical descent rate in feet per second throughout the final approach. Now that you're in program 66, your controls will be a little different. The rotational control will change the attitude of the LEM, the direction it's pointing. It should also be in attitude hold mode, so if you were to just let go of the stick, it'll stay in the direction it's pointing. You can use this to change your velocity somewhat like a helicopter. Want to slow down? Lean back. It'll make your engine thrust against the direction of travel and slow you down. Want to speed up? Lean forward. Want to move side to side? Well, you get the idea. Also at your disposal is the reaction control system. By moving the handle in your left hand, you can add small horizontal movements using the RCS thrusters. This will be especially handy as your LMP reads out your horizontal velocity components in the final moments before landing. As much as possible, you want to know these velocities out. The LEM can handle a harder landing than you might think, but it's still pretty delicate. I mean, just look at it. At this point, you should have a nice, flat, clean spot picked out. Time to put her down. You were only given barely enough fuel to get this done, with a very narrow extra margin. Both Houston and your LMP will do a good job reminding you of how much fuel is left, but don't let yourself get distracted. Focus on the task at hand, nulling out your horizontal velocity and gently moving towards the surface. Just remember that the last few feet take a little longer than you might expect, so while you shouldn't rush, don't dally either. For the final approach, nearly all of your horizontal velocity should be gone, as confirmed by your LMP. You should be upright and slowly descending vertically towards your date with destiny. The dust will be flying, but you should still be able to see well enough. If not, watch your rate meters closely. In just a few seconds, that little blue contact light you've been waiting on for years will illuminate and... Actually, <laughs> I think you could take it from here. Oh, come on, you didn't really think I was going to give you, my dear listeners, a lunar landing before we did it for realsies on Apollo 11, did you? No, that just won't do. Next time, we'll be starting the final leg of Kennedy's grand adventure. Apollo 11 is here at last. It's time to cement the names of Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins into history for eternity. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass.